open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. We'll get started here. It's good to see the editors back in town. Amen. Glad to have them with us tonight. It's good to come to church on a Sunday night. I know some of you might not be used to that. So don't be getting too sleepy. Amen. Well, you've been spoiled here the last six weeks, getting these Sunday evening naps and all that stuff. Hopefully you've got that out of the way. Man told me coming in here to preach it hot. He said, I want my toes bruised when I leave. <laughs> so if you look like you're nodding off, I'm going to get the hammer out. I'm going to aim for your toes. <laughs> Maybe not, but we're going to talk a little bit about that hammer tonight. And I've uh, been preaching a lot about the, uh, the Word of God lately, and I've uh, been preaching a lot about the Bible, and uh, I'm going to continue that tonight. <clears throat> it has been said uh, that, uh, amen, good to see the wells coming in, amen. <laughs> Thought you'd sneak in there, I ain't going to let you sneak in. But it's kind of hard to sneak in when you're sitting on the third row anyhow, isn't it? But, uh, amen. But um, I guess it's been said by probably a lot of churches, sim very similar to ours, you make too much of the Bible. You, you pound that King James Bible. You worship that King James Bible. Well, we don't worship that book, but we sure do worship the one that it is very similar to. And uh, it is so close, the written Word of God is so close to the incarnate Word of God uh, that it's just unbelievable. Uh, but uh, so we try to make much of the Word of God. I got you in Revelation 5. I know you've seen the verse, but just for, uh, just for just looking at it again, it's good to look at the Bible. Amen. Hold your place, stick a track or something there in Revelation 5. Come to Psalm 138. Psalm 138, I might have mentioned this just recently, but I think it's good to mention it again tonight. We'll see here in just a minute, um, the Bible will produce worship. Matter of fact, it produces the right kind of worship. Matter of fact, without the Bible, you can't really truly worship God properly. Because they that worship Him must worship Him how? Spirit and in truth. And if you don't have the truth, man, you can't worship God anyway. Okay. Amen. So, so God uh, really puts uh, a high regard on His Word. He holds it in high esteem, if you will. Very high. Psalm 138, verse 1. I will praise thee with my whole heart. Before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. Verse 2. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness. And for thy truth, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. We just read this morning, neither is there, I'm talking about any other name given under heaven among men, whereby we must be saved. That's a pretty high name. We read a little bit in Philippians chapter 2, where God hath highly exalted him, given him a name above every name. Uh, the Lord says here, he exalts his word above all thy, uh, thou hast word, magnified thy word above all thy name. That's, that's a pretty high place, if you will. All right, come back with me to Revelation chapter 5. So I don't feel uh, any, um, I don't feel one bit intimidated. I don't feel one bit bashful. I don't feel one bit um, like I'm uh, being redundant or preaching too much on the Word of God. Uh, it's my duty, it is part of my uh, whatever you want to call it, calling, be exact, from the Word of God. My job is to feed you the Word of God. Uh, that's scriptural, amen, First Peter 5. But if I can get you in the Word of God, I'm, I'm, doing, I'm, doing, I'm, doing my, I'm doing my job. If I can get you reading the Scriptures, if I can get you studying the Scriptures, uh, praise God for that. That's that uh, mission accomplished, amen. And uh, so we'll talk more about this 
in just a minute. Just before we read the, the text, I think I've read this illustration before, but I kind of liked it. And um, this professor, <clears throat> J.A. Uh, uh, Carson, Carson, however you pronounce his name, I'm not sure there, but says, In Your Body, uh, speaks of hunger. I guess he wrote a book called Your Body. And he speaks of hunger, and he says this, A bird can go nine days without food. A bird can go nine days without food. A man, twelve days. A dog can go 20 days without food. Poor, poor little feller. <laughs> a turtle, <laughs> a turtle can go 500 days without food. How in the world do they live so long? A stinking little turtle will go 500 days without food. A snake, God kill them all. A snake can go, sad to say, 800 days without food. That rascal can go two stinking years hanging around my house without food. <laughs> a snake can go, what is it, 800 days? Um, he says here, he says, uh, let's see, lost my place. A fish can go 1,000 days <laughs> without food. Who, who studies this stuff? You know? So a fish, a fish can go, go uh, what did I say, a thousand days uh, without, without food. Insects, 1,200 days. Uh, food, he says, but food is necessary, nonetheless, for all of God's creatures. Then he says... There are some turtle Christians which can go 500 days without much real Bible meat. And many bird Christians who go more than nine days without any Bible food. Not a few fish Christians who go a thousand days without eating much of the honey and meat and the bread of the Word of God. And then he says, classify yourself. Amen. Classify yourself. Where are you at? In that now, I, now, when I talk about that kind of thing, there I'm not talking about what you get from preaching. Amen. I'm talking about what you get from reading, from reading your Bible. So I have a hard time understanding. Save it. That don't work. Read it anyway. Amen. Read it anyway. We were talking this morning <clears throat> a little bit after the service. And uh, the statement was made about understanding the Bible the first time you read it through. Do you remember the first time you read it through? Hope you've read it through. Do you remember the first time you read it through? Do you remember looking back going, I ain't got a clue. That's probably what you did when you read it through. You probably went, man, I, I'm, I'm, this is, I ain't got a clue. But it's good. But it's good. Amen? And, uh, of course, reading the Bible, attending church, and, and getting to preaching and teaching help clarify some of that. But, but you need, you need, you need a, a daily dose of, of the Bible. You need, you need to read it. Uh, you need to read it daily. I'm going to preach a little bit about the Bible tonight, um, about the written Word of God, <clears throat> about the Word of God. I don't know where I got this, but I like it. Adam failed it. Noah feared it. That is the Word of God. Moses said, never forget it. Joshua followed it. Um, David was fascinated by it. Solomon forsook it. Daniel figured, he figured on it. <laughs> uh, the prophets fearlessly proclaimed it. Jesus Christ founded it. Paul said, faith cometh by it. Uh, there's some others there, I'll skip it. Uh, Peter defined it. Uh, John was faithful to write it. <laughs> uh, we ought to be faithful to read it. Yeah. Amen. It's a great book. I'll probably say that more than once tonight. And the reason I'll say that is because it is a great book. Yeah. And you can't, you can't deny that fact. The Bible is unlike any other book in the world. It's unmatched. 
It's unmatched in its uh, literary work. It's unmatched in its prophecy. It's just unmatched from front to back, cover to cover. The Bible is unmatched. There's no, been no other book like it, neither will, neither, nor shall there ever be. <laughs> it's, it's a book of the ages. We say, what's that? That's my good old King James Bible. Thank God for this book. But you know, and again, and, I, and I'll say this again, uh, talking to get preach on reading it, you can, we can pound that all day long. Thank God for that King James Bible and all these perversions out here. Shame on these people, whatever you want to say, uh, and that kind of thing, and all the perversions that's out there. We know they're not the Word of God. We know where our Bible came from. You can preach and holler that all day long, but if you never read it, that doesn't do any good. Brother Luke and I was talking this morning. <clears throat> it was talking, and uh, was talking about some some heritage that came down and filtered down into Donald Trump's uh, life, and it had to do with the uh, uh, the revival. Where was that revival at, brother? Uh, the revival at uh, Isles of Lewis and uh, Duncan, but Campbell Duncan, I think, was over there preaching, and a big great revival broke out, and 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 all this, and somewhere along the line. A Bible got passed down a couple of generations, and supposedly Donald Trump has one of those Bibles. Okay. Well, it don't do no good if he don't read it. Amen. You can make a, uh, a relic out of that just as bad as the Catholic Church does with some of their stuff. But if you never read it, and I'm not discrediting the Bible, I'm not sure what kind it is or any of that kind of thing. I'm, I'm assuming it's a King James Bible being from that era. But nonetheless, if you never read it, what good is it? It can sit there on the shelf and it's just, it's, it's closed pages. <laughs> Amen. Here you go. I think I've given you this before, but this goes with this. Time on social media. It says, oh, preacher, we're just getting back to church. You're going to get us on that again? Well... Time on social media, they say, is ever increasing. It's hard to put a number on it. They, they can't keep up with it. They try to estimate time on social media. They can't keep up with it. It's ever increasing. I don't remember the exact date. I didn't write it down here. I should have where I got these numbers. But they say that teens, the average teenager, spends nine hours a day on social media of some form. Nine Cotton picking hours a day on social media. That ought to raise the hair on the back of your neck. 30% of all time spent online is allocated to social media interaction. The majority, and that almost sounds low to me, but the majority of that time is on some type of mobile device. Some type of mobile device. Now listen, I realize the day and age in which we live and all that, and I understand, I understand all that. I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just giving you some numbers here. The majority of that time is spent on a mobile device. Overall, overall, 60% of social media time is spent or, or fi facilitated on or by a mobile device. The average person... At this time, the average person spends two hours a day engaged with that activity. Two hours a day. Don't tell me you don't have time to read your Bible. Everybody is busy. Everybody's busy. You have to learn. There's no shortcuts. You have to learn to make time to make yourself read your Bible. There's no other way around it. There's no formula. There's no secret. There's no oh, moment. Right? You just got to say, all right, whatever it is, I'm going to get my lazy carcass out of bed and I'm going to read and, and do it. Or I'm, anymore, I can't hardly read at night. Man, I, I'm, I, hit, I, I can't do it. If I'm, going to, and I'm sitting in the bed and I'm reading, it ain't long. <laughs> I'm reading the back of my eyelids. I, I, I fall asleep. I can't do it. i got to read sometime during the day. If I try to read at night, I might get a little bit in there, but not a whole lot. Can I get a witness? Okay, amen. At least I'm not by myself there. But we've got an amazing book. 
And you do yourself, you do yourself a disservice when, when you don't read it. Let's read our text here, and then we'll preach a little bit from this text. Revelation 5, verse number 1. Revelation 5, verse number 1. And I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open, uh, excuse me, no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, <clears throat> which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beast and the elders, and the numbers of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands. That's a big number. Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power, and riches, and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing, and every creature which is in heaven, and on the earth, and under the earth, and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them, heard I saying, Blessing, and honor, and glory, and power, be unto him that sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb, forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. That's worthy of an Amen right there. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. That's a great chapter right there. Revelation 5 always sticks out in my mind as a great chapter. <clears throat> you see the lion of the tribe of Judah. You see the great book there uh, in his hand on the, of the one that's sitting on the throne. Of course, that's the Lord there, the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and uh, you say, what book is this? There's many spe- much speculation about what book specifically it is. Some say it's the book of Revelation. Some say it's the book of Daniel. Some say it's the Bible. Some say it's King James Bible and all that. Uh, I, you know, I, I don't know. I have my own ideas and all that. But, but nonetheless, uh, I believe it's Bible. But nonetheless, what a great book it is. What a great book uh, it is, regardless. Uh, if it's a book of Daniel, book of Revelation, nonetheless, some of that stuff's been sealed up and all that. Of course, at the time of the end here, uh, he's going to open it up to John. John's going to write and all that. A good indication here that this strong angel or whatever, as we've seen there in Revelation 22, uh, you pick up here at the beginning of the book of Revelation, this very well could have been Daniel speaking to John. Very well could have been. Uh, You say, well, I don't know about that. Well, whatever. You mean, you do what you want to with it. But uh, it wouldn't surprise me at all. Uh, After you read Daniel chapter 12 and you see where God told him to seal that thing up till the time of the end, and when uh, John's called up here, he's at the time of the end. And he's being showed some things. And uh, I, believe, uh, I believe the Lord, that'd be just like the Lord to say, Hey, Daniel, come on over here. <laughs> Got something for you to do. See, that John, see this fellow John here? I want you to instruct him here and help him out a little bit. That wouldn't surprise me at all. But nonetheless, the emphasis here that I'm trying to make <clears throat> is on the book, on the Word of God, the written Word of God. It, uh, number one, I want to say this. Uh, look, you see its worth. You see its worth here. It's, uh, this book is worth a whole lot. Uh, can, you, can, you put a, can you put a price tag on the Bible? We were, was out street preaching in Hamilton a couple weeks ago, and uh, Brother Joe and I was, and Brother Seth was standing there, and uh, my wife was over here talking to someone else, and in the meantime, this lady walked up and was talking to her, and she wanted something to eat. And it was one of those deals where it's not, uh, can, you, can you please get me something to eat? It wasn't one of those deals. It was more or less, give me your money. You ever seen those kind? Give me some money. You look like you've got some money. Give me some money. 
you owe me some money. It's one of those type. You, know, you understand what I'm saying? It's one of those type deals. I'm not against helping people, but when you start that stuff, almost like, you know, to hit the road. Amen? Well, that's kind of what was going on there. And then she, she got done over there, couldn't get nothing out of her, so she walked over to where we, we was at. She didn't say a whole lot. I forget what all she said to start with there, but then she looked, looked at us and she said, uh, will you give me one of your Bibles? I want one of your Bibles. And we just kind of looked at one another and all of a sudden all the eyes kind of came this direction. <laughs> and she looked at me and she said, I said, excuse me? She said, I want one of your Bibles. And I said, well, I don't, you know, I don't, we probably got one around here somewhere. Let me look in my trunk of my car. I usually try to take extra Bibles when we go street preaching. And uh, I said, we can get you a Bible. She said, no, no, I want... I want one of your all's Bibles. She was a black lady. I was whatever. She, I, want one of y'all, I want one of y'all's Bibles. I'm kind of like, I'm kind of partial to my Bible. I didn't say that, but I'm thinking that. You know, if, if I'd have just led her to the Lord, because I've done that, lead somebody to the Lord, kind of like, oh, this is a good Bible right here, but I'm going to give this to this person. Amen? Ain't nothing wrong with that. Now, I don't know if I'd do that with this one, but... <laughs> But my street preaching Bible, I might do that. Amen. There's nothing wrong with that kind of thing, I guess. If you want to give them your personal Bible and with all your notes in it and your years of whatever, help yourself. But I'm not going to do that. I'm going to try to get them one. Right? And so we're, we're kind of backing up on her a little bit. And uh, she said, I want one of your old Bible. I said, well, you know, I'll see if I got one in the car for you like that. No, nah, and she got frustrated and, and left. You know what she's going to do? She's going to take it and sell it. They, they, they tell us in the prison, you've heard all these stories probably, they tell us in the prison they take them and smoke them. Take the pages and roll them up and smoke them. They can't get no, nothing else. You'd think the ink would just kill you. Wouldn't you? That's the kind of worth they put on it. But i got to think about that. If she was to sell it, I wonder what she'd sell it for. Now, listen, I know we give them away. We try to, right? Ralph sells them, but we give them away. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> Whatever. I'm, I understand what he's doing and all that, but you understand what we're doing here. Amen? Well, I mean, and some, some of these Bibles, you know, you, they're, they're expensive, Right? You want to take care of them and all that kind of thing. And all. But how do you, man, what kind of price tag do you put on your Bible? What kind of price tag would you put on your Bible? That's my Bible. Amen. That, that right there is my Bible. Don't fool with my Bible. Don't touch my Bible. Amen. Don't mess with it. Don't spill nothing on it. If anybody spills something on it, it should be me or my wife, nobody else. And then I don't know about that one. <laughs> Amen. That's my Bible. That is my companion right there. That is my weapon right there. That's my sword. Don't touch my... It's just like if I had my, my, my pistol or whatever. Don't touch my gun. That's mine, right? That's my Bible. Don't take it on accident just because it looks like yours. Amen. But you know what? That's a great book. It's worth. Why is it worth so much? It's a book. He said, yeah, but you know why? Because it's God's book. That is God's book. That's not Paul's book. That's not Moses' book. Right? That's not Daniel's book. That's the Lord Jesus Christ's book. That is God's book. You can't put a value on that. You can't put a number on that. Now, I understand what we do, again, when we... Produce them and all that, and you put different kinds of leather on it, makes it more valuable and all that stuff. But, but in all reality, there are some people, I don't know what that thing was worth that was given to me as a gift. That's a lambskin, lambskin Hoffman Bible. That's a good one. Uh, whatever, I don't care what you think about Hoffman. I like the Bible. It's a good Bible. Amen. I agree with all the notes in it. Amen. It's a good Bible. I like it. It's my Bible. You couldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't, there ain't enough money. You, well, I don't know, maybe, I don't know. But do you understand what I'm saying? How do you put a worth on that? It's worth, it's, it's invaluable. Where well, there are some people 
they would give almost everything they have to get one copy. To get one copy. And then share it. We could give all kinds of illustrations for that, but for sake of time tonight, it's God's book. It's the Lord's book. He's the one that authored it. When you begin to read its pages and you read it from cover to cover and you read it from cover to cover and then again you read it from cover to cover and then you read it again and again and again, you, it, it begins to dawn on you. There is no way in the world that any men could have put this thing together. It's a divine, it has a divine author. It's supernaturally produced. The Bible calls it given by inspiration. <laughs> Amen. So we're talking about God's book. It's worth, it's worth is, is matchless because it's God's book and because it's a great book. We've mentioned this already. Why is it a great book? Why is it, a, why is it so, so great? It's a, it's, it's a great book. Uh, here's an illustration. In the dawn of the English Reformation, when the great Bible, just translated, stood on its desk, chained to a pillar in the cathedral, the people gathered in throngs and standing on the stone floor listened attentively Hour after hour, and if the reader paused, they would cry out, Read on! Read on! They wanted to hear more. You see, they came through the dark ages where the Bible was not available to them like it is to you and me. You read about Ezra standing down there in the street, and they made a pulpit of wood, and he gets up on that platform and he begins to read the Bible. Reads for something like, what, eight hours? And the people stood and listened. You think you could get people to stand and just listen to hear the Word of God read tonight? <laughs> I'm not against comfortable pews or whatever and those kind of things, but I'm just trying to get you to see something. Well, that's a great book. It contains God's words. It contains the living words of a living God. It's great because of its authenticity. It's great because of its ability. You say it's ability? Yeah, it's ability. We could go on and on all night about that. Dr. George Washington Carver, the great uh, Negro scientist. Can I use that word? There's nothing wrong with that word. The great Negro scientist of Tuskegee Institute He's gone to be with Christ, obviously, but after spending his life for others, for years he urged his people in the South, his people, talking about uh, colored folk, black folk, whatever you want to call it, African, I'll leave it at that. Uh, for years he urged his people in the South to plant crops besides cotton. For if that crop failed, all was lost. He finally persuaded them to plant peanuts. You thought it was Jimmy Cotta. However, they raised more peanuts than they knew what to do with. Carver then prayed for wisdom whereby the peanut might be put to some new uses. His prayer was answered and he discovered how to make oils, varnishes, colorings, medicines, and a hundred other things from peanuts. How come George Washington Carver doesn't get any recognition in the month of February? This thought I'd ask. He was invited to testify before a Senate committee. There he was asked in a mockingly manner, Dr. Carver, how did you learn all these things? He replied from an old book. And the chairman asked, what book? He said, the Bible. Laughter began to fill the room. The chairman asked, the senator asked, does the Bible tell about peanuts? in a mockingly manner. He was unwavered. He answered, No, Mr. Senator, but it tells about the God who made the peanut. And I asked him to show me what to do with the peanut, and he did. Amen. See, so what are you talking about tonight? I'm saying this is a great book because of its ability. Amen. It's a great book, not only because of its authenticity and its ability, but this is a great book because it's, it's alive. It's alive. Do we need to even read Hebrews, uh, what is that, Hebrews 4.12? Do we even need to go there tonight? 
little boy who was in the habit of attending gospel preaching every Sunday evening was unable to go one evening, as you've experienced here in the last several weeks. So he stayed at home and decided to read his Bible. His mother was upstairs tending to little ones and did not know what her boy was doing, but uh, noticed how quiet he got. <laughs> and you know as well as I do, when the little one's boys get quiet, you better find out what's going on. What's going on down there? I don't hear no racket. <laughs> so she checks on him. And uh, she figured he was up to some type of mischief. And uh, so she uh, calls downstairs, What are you doing, Henry? And the lad replies, I'm watching Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead. No, he wasn't watching television. He was reading his Bible. What a beautiful answer. He was, of course, reading the 11th chapter of John. And it was all very real to him. And at the end of this illustration, it says, Do you read your Bible like this? Is it real to you? This book is alive. It's a living book. Not only is it a great book because of its authenticity and its ability and because it's alive, it's a great book because of its accuracy. It's accuracy. In 1615, William Harvey discovered the circulation of the blood in the human body and that the life principle resided therein. Scientists had regarded this as an amazing discovery, revealed over 300, obviously, 300 years ago. What, 400 now? Over 400 years ago. And you know as well as I do where I'm going with this, but the Bible says in Leviticus 17, 11, that the life of the flesh is in the blood. Without blood, your kidneys cannot live. Without blood pumping from your heart, your lungs cannot function properly. Without blood, your brain will not work. Without blood pumping from your heart, uh, uh, your intestines won't work right. Nothing works right. They finally put this together in 1615. See, what are you talking about? I'm telling you the Bible is accurate. Scientifically, prophetically, historically, from the front cover to the back cover. It's, not, it's more than just a spiritual book. And it's accurate. Its accuracy makes it great. You could go on some more with that. We'll let that go. It's a great book because if it's accountability, because if it's accountability, you can't get away from the Bible. God will take that book and He'll pierce your heart with it. He'll remind you of it. He'll bring verses to mind sometimes that you haven't, haven't heard or haven't memorized or forgotten that you memorized. Sometimes when you need those things, God brings them back to you. Not only that, but in, that, in knowing that, God can use that, that very same thing to hold you accountable. God will bring back His Word uh, and, and your memory and hold you accountable to it. You are accountable to read God's Word. What a great treasure God has, has given. What a great price. It's been said many, many times, times, but what a great price that men and women have sacrificed the time that they've given the, the years they've given, the lives that's been given, the blood that's been given, literally, to give us this book right here. Well, we're accountable to read it at least once. We're accountable to read it. You may have heard this, but the great so-called Patrick Henry, what do you say? What is he known for? Give me liberty, or you know what he said about the Bible? Patrick Henry, near his death, near his death, he said this. The treasure, talking about the Bible, he said, the treasure of the Bible is a book, uh, the Bible, worth more than all others that were ever printed. He said, it is my misfortune never to have taken the time to read it. What a sad, what a sad case that is from such a so-called great man in American history. Maybe he did do some great things or whatever you want to say. But my, my soul, I wonder what God thinks. I don't know if he was saved or lost. I've heard some quotations he's made about 
Jesus Christ and this and that and the other. But what a sad thing it is to stand at the judgment seat of Christ. I was there during the formation of the United States of America. Yeah, but what did you do with my book? I was a great attorney and helped some of your preachers. But what did you do with my book? There's an accountability that comes with the Bible. I'm taking more time than I want with this first point. <laughs> but it's a great book. It's a great book because of its accuracy, its accountability. And I want to say this, it's a great book because it's against this world. They have hated this book. The world has hated this book and has tried to outlaw it. They've tried to ban it. They've tried to burn it. They've tried to get rid of it. They've tried education. They've tried communism. They've tried dictatorships. They've tried kings and despots. You name it. It's, they've tried to burn it out, flood it out. They've tried to do everything in the world to get rid of this book. And they can't do it. They're against this book. But you know what? This book is against them. Someone said God's word has been a hammer for 19 centuries. And when other hammers today try to break God's eternal anvil of truth, we remember the inscription on the monument to the Huguenots at, at Paris. You ought to look up who the Huguenots are if you don't know. That's part of your lineage, your spiritual lineage, your spiritual heritage. They said this, Hammer away, ye hostile hands, your hammers break. God's anvil stands reference to the Word of God and it does and it just keeps right on standing and it just keeps right on standing and it keeps right on standing it's a great book are you reading it are you making it your book are you searching it the old preacher give this years ago how to search the scriptures search search the scriptures Jesus Christ said search the scriptures you're told to search the scriptures and Read the Scriptures and search them out. Search, S-E-A-R-C-H. Search, search them seriously. Search the Scriptures seriously. Search them, E, earnestly. Earnestly. Search them, A, anxiously. Search them, R, regularly. Regularly. Search them, C, carefully. And then lastly, search them with an H, humbly. I don't remember the old Scottish preacher's name, but he stood up to preach one time and a young Bible student was in the congregation. He heard the old man preach and he marveled. He marveled at, at this old backwoodsman and the knowledge that he'd had of the Scriptures and the things that he revealed uh, from the Word of God. And after the service, they sat down to talk and he, he began to ask him questions. How did you learn the Bible this way? Yeah, having never been to school, having never been to any, any such institution to learn uh, the Scriptures. How would you learn the Bible like you know the Bible? He said, I learned it on my knees. He said, I learned it on my knees, and I get on my knees and I read the Bible, and I humbly pray and I ask God to reveal it to me and show me the Word of God. You want to know the Bible? So, well, I'll pick up Dr. Ruckman's commentary. I learned the Bible. No, you won't. As much as we love Dr. Ruckman, I know he's gone to heaven and all that. You ain't going to, no, no, you won't. Yeah, you might learn some facts and figures, but you won't learn the book unless you get in the book. You must get in the book. He can teach you about the book, but if you want to learn the book, you've got to get in it and you've got to read it and you've got to study it and you've got to run the cross references yourself. Amen. You've got to search it. And you should because it's a great book. It's worth, it's worth, it's worth studying. It's worth it because it's God's book. It's worth it because it's a great book. Number two, there in Revelation chapter 5, you'll notice there in verses 2 and 3, you'll see some people that are unworthy of this book. They're unworthy to loose the seals. Again, reminds me of Daniel where God tells him to seal it up there and the prophecy that was given to Daniel in Daniel chapter 12, he's told to seal that thing up until the time of the end. Here, obviously, they're at the time of the end. 
And Jesus Christ here obviously looses the seals that are on, on, the, on the book here. They're unworthy to loose the seals, listen, uh, and they're unworthy to look in its sacred pages. That's what it says right here in verse 2 and 3. Uh, look what it says there in verse 2. And I saw a strong angel proclaim a loud, loud voice who is worthy to open the book and loose the seals thereof? Question mark. Nobody. No man anyway. And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. You realize, you realize in all seriousness, in all reality, we're unworthy tonight to even hold this thing in, in, our, in our laps, let alone open the thing up and look into its pages. What a blessing it is to hear it read. I've said it before, I love hearing, I mentioned it the other day, I think it was, I love hearing it preached in the public arena. I love hearing its verses quoted. I love seeing the scripture signs. I, 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 I love hearing uh, kids quote the book. But you know what I love also? I love hearing you quote the book. You know, we have a lot of times, I mentioned this I think the other day again, we send our kids to Sunday school classes and they'll give them memory verses and all that. We want them to learn their verses for Sunday school. Sometimes we enforce it, half the time it don't happen. Amen? Amen. But we sure like it when they get up here and quote them, don't we? We sure love it when they quote them for us, maybe at home on the couch or that kind of thing. How many verses do you know? How many verses can you quote tonight? It's not a matter of number and all that kind of thing. How much of this book have you got hidden in your heart? You say, Preacher, I just can't memorize Scripture. You'd be surprised what you can memorize. You'd be surprised what you can memorize. You've got to spend time with it. It don't, it don't just come like maybe, unless you're some kind of photographic memory type thing or whatever, it just don't come like that. You've got to spend time with that book. You've got you to go over it. You got to meditate on it. What I found, and maybe it don't work for everybody. You preach a verse three, four, five, six times, it starts to sink in, and you can remember it. <laughs> whatever I don't know what it might take. I don't know whatever it might uh, require of you, but you need to have some of the Word of God memorized. And I don't remember exactly how much it is now. Talking about the Moravian movement, which is another piece of your spiritual heritage which you ought to look into and some of the things that they did and all that but even to be part of that organization or whatever it was I don't know if it was a requirement or, or not but they had a, a school that they had set up for missionaries and, and, and was known for being uh, founded and being part of some of the modern if you will mission movement and they said some of these guys many of them at least at least had the first five books memorized What are you saying, oh me? Yeah, oh me. There went some of my toes. <laughs> we look at it as it's maybe not really that important. We've got it right there in, in my book. No, you need it here. That's, I, thank God you have it. Thank God you've got two or three. <laughs> thank God you can reach over to the shelf and say, let me see, let me look that up, let me... Thank God you can even reach over there, maybe even grab a concordance, and I'll find that verse. Thank God you can do that or have the ability to do that. But it'd be better if it was here. I don't know. You may know of some people that have got the thing memorized. And I know he's apostate now. I don't know if he's still alive. Is Jack Van Impey still alive? Anybody know? Is he dead? He went home to be with the Lord. And when that old boy started out, from what I understand, he had it right and would preach hot, hell hot, and preach salvation sweet and heaven sweet and that whole nine yards. And when I understand, believed the Bible. And then went kind of apostate there toward the end of his ministry and all that kind of stuff. But they said at one time, they called him the walking Bible. He had the whole thing memorized. New Testament, whatever it was. How do you, I look at that and I go, my soul, man, how do you even, I'll tell you how. You spend time with it. A teenager spends nine hours a day doing this. They know it inside and out, like the back of your hand. What's the old uh, 
funny proverbial thing. If you can't figure it out, give it to your kid. They'll figure it out for you. What about that book? Unworthy to look in its sacred pages. Oh, what a treasure it is. All right, I'm going to say this. Number three, notice verse four. Try to hurry up and be done here. Notice what John says. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. John was weeping. He's weeping over this book. You ever weep over it? You preachers, you ever weep over it? You teachers out there, you ever weep over that book? God, I got five kids in my Sunday school class. God, I don't want to mess up your book. I don't want to mess up the living words of God. I want to manifest them. I want to teach them. I want to explain these words properly and in a way where the Holy Spirit of God just removes me completely out of the way and where you have complete control and access and captivate their hearts and captivate their mind. God, reveal this book to me so that I can reveal it to someone else. You ever weep over that book? So I'm not a preacher or a teacher. God, reveal that book to me so that I can take it and explain someone the way of eternal life in a way that's clear, in a way that's plain, in a way that's simple to understand. And it is simple to understand. You ever weep over it? That's our book. King James Bible all the way. Need to be winning souls the whole nine yards. You ever weep over that book? Can you pull five verses out of your back pocket right now? Let me tell you how to be saved. Five? Four? One? So all I got is John 3, 16. At least you got one. All right, now get two. And then when you get two, get three. Amen. Amen. See, I'm not just trying to kick you down the road. Then when you get three, add another one, get four. And next thing you know, you pull that thing out, that thing's you're a Bible scholar. That's no kidding. You guys know what I'm talking about. You quote three, four, five, six verses, they'll go, whoa, that guy really knows the Bible. John wept over it. Wept over its pages. You got any tear stains on your pages? You got coffee stains? Water stains? How about tear stains? Any tear stains on your pages? The pages of your old black book? Any tear stains on the pages of that book? When you need God and you're running, you got any tear stains in the book of Psalms? When you need God, you say, God, I got to have you. God, I need your presence. God, my family needs you. I need you, God. Please, God. And just get in there and search it out, man. Search it out. And Lord, I ain't coming out till I get some answers. I've got to have some answers. Got any tear stains on that book? Any weeping over that book? John wept over it. I'll skip some of this. Because of this book, we're going to win. Jesus Christ, but because of Jesus Christ, who prevailed and won, we're able to open the book and read it. We have a New Testament. And that thing is of no effect until the blood of the testator is shed. He shed his blood. And, of course, died on that cross and three days later arose victoriously. You know what that does? That gives that book power. How, do you, how does the world say what they want to? I'm an atheist. So what? Does that mean we're supposed to tremble in our boots and we have to get into a scientific debate with you? I read an illustration about a mechanic. They called him up. He was a mechanic and... 
uh, different means. They called him up and said, we need you to work on this, this telescope. The astronomers, the astronomers are looking at this. I don't know if it was a Hubble what it was. I don't think it was. It was years ago. And they're looking up at the stars in the sky, and they call this guy in. He's working on the telescope. And then lunchtime rolls around. He slips over in the corner, pulls out his Bible, and begins to read. The chief astronomer comes in and says, what you doing there? He says, I'm reading my Bible. <laughs> reading that old book, huh? All them fairy tales. How do you know it's true? They began to debate back and forth, and this, and that, and the other. And uh, finally, he asked him, he said, um, <clears throat> you believe the, the mathematical table, the multiplication table, and all that stuff? He said, yeah. He said, who founded it? He said, well, I don't, I'm not sure. Off the top of my head. He said, but you believe it, right? And he said, well, sure. He said, why do you believe it? He said, well. He got kind of aggravated with the guy. Finally, he said, because it works, that's why. And he said, that's the same reason why I believe my Bible. Because it works. Amen. Does it work for you? Works for me. Matter of fact, it works so much, I'm on the winning side. I, every now and then, I like to read Revelation. Read the back of the book there. Just to see how we do win. And I read it, it seems like more and more lately because we're getting closer and closer to it. And I'm looking forward to it. We, we're, we're the winners. All right, number five. Lastly, let me, see, let me show you, see this. You notice from verse 18 to 14, this book produces worship. I mentioned this in, in briefly uh, beginning, but you'll notice in verse number eight there, you'll see supplication. There's prayer there. All prayer is not... All, every time you hear someone praying, that does not mean that it's supplication as far as asking. Sometimes in prayer can be just nothing but adoration. You can, you can worship God in prayer. Amen. You can, you can worship God by yourself in your own house or in your closet or your car or whatever. You just pray to God. You can just brag on God and just glorify Him and lift Him up and praise Him and just tell Him how great He is and how wonderful He is, how much you love Him and thank Him for how much He loves you and thank Him for all He's done for you and just, man, just... Tell them ain't nobody like him and he's just higher than any other God in the complete universe and nobody can match him, nobody can touch him, nobody can even come close to him. You can worship him in your prayer closet all by yourself. You know, I personally think the Lord likes that. You'll see that in verse 8 there. Notice those prayers of the saints going up. You didn't read about that until the book's opened here. This book produces worship of God. You read this thing, it does nothing more but just point to God, point to God, point to Jesus Christ, point to the Creator, and on and on the list goes. It just points to Him and points to Him. You know what in turn it'll do? You'll want to love Him. You'll want to worship Him. Look at verse 9. This book produces singing. You know singing is a form of worship. We sang some songs tonight. This is my story, this is my song. What's the next word? Praise. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praise. Praising my Savior all the day long. Yeah. I love to praise Him in song. Yeah. I enjoy it. You ought to too. There's something wrong with you if you don't. Well, I don't like I don't like music. I don't like singing. You better get used to it. We laugh when we say that, but you better get used to it because there's a whole lot of it going on in heaven. God enjoys music, the right kind of music. We were sitting around the house the other day. We put Handel's Messiah on. He said, "I thought that was only for Christmas time." What are you talking about? Put that thing on there, man, that thing started. Hallelujah. And then, then, then all them parts started coming into play and all that. Man, just beautiful music. Someone said George Frederick Handel was a saved man. I believe it. I think they said he wrote that thing something like 17 minutes. Pfft, phenomenal. I don't know how accurate that is. But if he did, goodness gracious. You ever listen to that thing closely? 
Go find it tonight. You, but when you get home tonight, look it up on your little mobile device. Pull it up and let, it, let that mobile device bring forth some praise to God. And crank it up as loud as it'll go. If you have to, plug it into a speaker and fill the entire house with its music. Amen. That is good stuff. That stuff there, that stuff there will minister to your spirit more than just this flesh. It'll feed the soul and minister to the spirit. It'll, it, that, that stuff manage it. Maybe it's just me. I just like that stuff. Singing. I love the old hymns. We could go on about that. Much preaching has been done about that. But you know what that hymn book is designed for? Worship of God. Worship. They're songs of worship. It's not just strobe lights, fog machines, make me feel good. I just love praising God. No, you don't. You just like going to a rock concert. That's all. I just don't, I just don't understand. You know, you guys go in there and you sing them old boring hymns. That's because you're dead spiritually. You've got too much of the flesh that's alive. That's why. You need to kill some of it and rejuvenate and get in that book and renew your mind. That has to do with your spirit. That book will do that. It will produce that. Produces singing. Verse number 11. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beast and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Same with a, a what? A what? A loud voice. You know what they're doing? This book produces supplication and worship. This book produces singing and worship. And this book produces shouting and worship. So I don't like all that shouting. And again, you better get used to it. Because if you don't, heavens, you're just going to be so uncomfortable. All that singing, all that shouting, all that praising going on. You ain't going to like it. I'm going to be right in the middle of it going like this. Just keep it going. Just get it. Maybe the Lord let me help lead the choir. I better be careful with that. Last guy did that, got in trouble, didn't he? <laughs> it produces worship. It produces worship of the Lamb. It produces worship of the Lamb for His acts. Look at verse 9. We read it tonight. Let's read it and we'll finish tonight. Look at verse 9. It produces worship of the Lamb for His acts and for His attributes. Verses 9 and 10 are His acts. And they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for Thou wast slain. Can you hear them singing it? For Thou wast slain. I don't know how they sing that. And hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And hast made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. They're singing that stuff. For his, that, that, that's his mighty acts right there. That's the actions of Jesus Christ and the things that he's done. And then they worship him for his attributes. Verse 12, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is a lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing and every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and under the Lamb forever and ever and the four beasts said Amen and the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever you know what produced that right there? one book one book I just can't figure out why some people get so excited because they've been in the book. They've been in the book. I know people are different as far as how they respond and all that stuff, but I know this. Man, if you're in that book and the preacher gets up there preaching, it'll get stirring down in your soul and it'll stir you up and every now and then you might just throw out a little, Amen. <laughs> There's one. I remember, the, I'll say this and I'm done. I remember the first time I went down to a blowout. Very first time I ever went down to a blowout. I thought, good night, I died and went to heaven. That place got going, big got the singing. 
They got the shouting, they got the ho hollering and hooting and going on. And I know, listen, I know that don't mean always that, you know, God is there and all that. But boy, it sure was good. It sure was good. And I know in heaven they do a lot of it. You got a great book. Can I encourage you? Can I motivate you? Can I stir you tonight? Read it. Read it. Memorize it. Get in it. Learn it. Live it. Sure will make a difference in your life. Let's stand for prayer tonight. I'm done.